The Conversation of Iros and Charmian, published in Burton's Gentleman's Magazine, December 1839. It begins with a quote from Euripides, who said, I will bring fire to thee. The two characters in this dialogue are Iros and Charmian. And forgive me if I've mispronounced either of those names. Iros, why do you call me Iros? Charmian, so henceforward will you always be called. You must forget to my earthly name and speak to me as Charmian. Iros, this is indeed no dream. Charmian, dreams are with us no more, but of these mysteries anon, I rejoice to see you looking lifelike and rational. The film of the shadow has already passed from off your eyes. Be of heart and fear nothing. Your allotted days of stupor have expired, and tomorrow I will myself induct you into the full joys and wonders of your novel existence. Iros, true, I feel no stupor, none at all. The wild sickness and the terrible darkness have left me, and I hear no longer that mad rushing horrible sound like the quote, voice of many waters unquote. yet my senses are bewildered charmian with the keenness of their perception of the new charmian a few days will remove all this but i fully understand you and feel for you it is now 10 earthly years since i underwent what you undergo yet the rem remembrance of it hangs by my by me still <laughs> yet the remembrance of it hangs by me still you have now suffered all of pain however which you will suffer in Aden Iros in Aden Charmian in Aden Iros oh God pity me Charmian I am overburthened with the med and it's spelled that way overburthened with the majesty of all things, of the unknown, now known, of the speculative future merged in the august and certain present. Charmian, grapple not now with such thoughts. Tomorrow we will speak of this. Your mind wavers, and its agitation will find relief in the exercise of simple memories. Look not around, not forward, but back. I am burning with anxiety to hear the details of that stupendous event which threw you among us. Tell me of it. Let us converse of familiar things, in the old familiar language of the world which has so fearfully perished. Iros, most fearfully, fearfully, this is indeed no dream. Charmian, dreams are no more. Was I much mourned, my Iros? Iros, Mourned, Charmian? Oh, deeply. To that last hour of all, there hung a cloud of intense gloom and devout sorrow over your household. Charmian. And that last hour, speak of it. Remember that, beyond the naked fact of the catastrophe itself, I know nothing. Remember, when coming out from among mankind, I passed into night through the grave. At that period, if I remember aright, the calamity which overwhelmed you was utterly unanticipated. But indeed, I knew little of the speculative philosophy of the day. Iros. The individual calamity was, as you say, entirely unanticipated, but analogous misfortunes have long been a subject of discussion with astronomers. I need scarce tell you, my friend, that even when you left us, men had agreed to understand these passages in the most holy writings which speak of the final destruction of all things by fire as having reference to the orb of the earth alone. But in regard to the immediate agency of the ruin, speculation had been at fault from that epoch in astro astronomical knowledge in which the comets were divested of the terrors of flame. 
the very moderate density of these bodies had been well established. They had been observed to pass among the satellites of Jupiter without bringing about any sensible alteration either in the masses or in the orbits of these secondary planets. We had long regarded the wanderers as vapory creations of inconceivable tenuity and as altogether incapable of doing injury to our substantial globe even in the event of contact. But contact was not in any degree dreaded, for the elements of all the comets were accurately known. That among them we should look for the agency of the threatened fiery destruction had been for many years considered an inadmissible idea. But wonders and wild fancies had been of late days strangely rife among mankind, and, although it was only with a few of the ignorant, that actual apprehension prevailed upon the announcement by astronomers of a new comet, yet this announcement was generally misreceived with I know not what of agitation and mistrust. The elements of the strange orb were immediately calculated, and it was at once conceded by all observers that its path at perihelion would bring it very into very close proximity with the Earth. There were two or three astronomers of secondary note who resolutely maintained that a contact was inevitable. I cannot very well express to you the effect of this intelligence upon the people. For a few short days they would not believe an assertion which their intellect, so long employed among worldly considerations, could not in any manner grasp. But the truth of a virtually important a vitally important fact soon makes its way into the understanding of even the most stolid. Finally, all men saw that astronomical knowledge li lied not, and they await awaited the comet. Its approach was not at first seemingly rapid, nor was its appearance of very unusual character. It was of a dull red and has very little perceptible train. For seven or eight days we saw no material increase in its apparent diameter and but a partial alteration in its color. Meanwhile, the ordinary affairs of men were discarded and all interests absorbed in a growing discussion instituted by the philosophic in respect to the cometary nature. Even the grossly ignorant ar aroused their sluggish capacities to such considerations. They learned now gave their intellect, their soul, to no such points as the allaying of fear or to the sustenance of loved theory. They sought, they panted for right views. They groaned for perfected knowledge. Truth arose in the purity of her strength and exceeding majesty, and the wise bowed down and adored. That material injury to our globe or to its inhabitants would result from the apprehended contact was an opinion which hourly lost ground among the wise, and the wise were now freely permitted to rule the reason and the fancy of the crowd. It was demonstrated that the density of the comet's nucleus was far less than that of our rarest gas, and the harmless passage of a similar visitor among the satellites of Jupiter was a point strongly insisted upon, and which served greatly to allay terror. Theologists, with an earnestness fear kindled, dwelt upon the biblical prophecies and expounded them to the people with a directness and simplicity of which no previous instance had been known. That the final destruction of the earth must be brought about by the agency of fire was urged with a spirit that enforced every where conviction and that the comets were of no fiery nature, as all men now knew, was a truth which relieved all in a great measure from the apprehensions of the great calamity foretold. It is noticeable that the popular prejudices and vulgar errors in regard to pestilences and wars, errors which were wont to prevail upon every appearance of a comet, were now altogether unknown, as if by some sudden convulsive exertion reason had at once hurled superstition from her throne. The feeblest intellect had derived vigor from excessive interest. 
What minor evils might arise from the contact were points of elaborate question. The learned spoke of slight geological disturbances, of, of probable alterations in climate, and consequently in vegetation, of possible magnetic and electric influences. Many held that no visible or perceptible effect would in any manner be produced. While such discussions were going on, their subject gradually approached, growing larger in apparent diameter and of a more brilliant luster, mankind grew paler as it came. All human operations were suspended. There was an epoch in the course of the general sentiment when the comet had attained at length a size surpassing that of any previously recorded visitation. The people now, dismissing any lingering hope that the astronomers were wrong, experienced all the certainty of evil. The, the chimerical or chimerical aspects of the terror was gone. The hearts of the stoutest of our race beat violently within their bosoms. A very few days sufficed, however, to merge even such feelings and sentiments more unendurable. We could no longer apply to the strange orb any accustomed thoughts. Its historical attributes had disappeared. It oppressed us with a hideously novelty of emotion. We saw it not as an astronomical phenomenon in the heavens, but as an incubus upon our hearts and a shadow upon our brains. It had taken with inconceivable rapidity the character of a gigantic mantle of rare flame extending from horizon to horizon. Yet a day and men breathed with greater freedom. It was clear that we were already within the influence of the comet, yet we lived. We even felt an unusual elasticity of frame and vivacity of mind. The exceeding tenuity of all the object of our dread was apparent, for all heavenly objects were plainly visible through it. Meantime, our vegetation had perceptibly altered, and we gained faith from this predicted circumstance in the foresight of the wise. A wild luxuriance of foliage, utterly unknown before, burst out upon every vegetable thing. Yet another day, and the evil was not altogether upon us, it was now evident that his nucleus would first reach us. A wild change had come over all men, and the first sense of pain was the wild signal for general lamentation and horror. This first sense of pain lay in a rigorous constriction of the breast and lungs, and an insufferable dryness of the skin. It could not be denied that our atmosphere was radically affected, the confirmation of this atmosphere and the possible modifications to it which might be subjected were now the topics of discussion. The result of investigation sent an electric thrill of the intensest terror through the universal heart of man. It had long been known that the air which encircled us was a compound of oxygen and nitrogen gases in the proportions of 21 measures of oxygen and 79 of nitrogen in every one hundredth of the atmosphere. Oxygen, which was the principle of combustion and the vehicle of heat, was absolutely necessary to the support of animal life and was the most powerful and energetic agent in nature. Nitrogen, on the contrary, was incapable of supporting either animal life or flame. An unnatural excess of oxygen would result, it had been ascertained, in just such an elevation of the animal spirits as we had latterly experienced. It was the pursuit, the extension of the idea, which had engendered awe. What would be the result of a total extraction of the nitrogen? A combustion irresistible, all-devouring, omniprevalent, immediate, the entire fulfillment in all their minute and terrible details of the fiery and horror-inspiring denunciations of the prophecies of the holy book. Why need I paint, Charmian, the now disenchained French frenzy of mankind? That tenuity in the comet which had previously inspired us with hope was now the source of the bitterness of despair. In its impalpable gaseous character, 
we clearly perceived the, consu the consummation of fate. Meantime, a day again passed, bearing away with it the last shadow of hope. We gasped in the rapid modification of the air. The red blood bounded tumultuously through its strict channels. A furious delirium possessed all men, and, with arms rigidly outstretched towards the threatened heavens, they trembled and shrieked aloud. But the nucleus of the destroyer was now upon us, even here in Aden, I shudder while I speak. Let me be brief. Brief is the ruin that overwhelmed. For a moment there was a wild lurid light alone, visiting and penetrating all things. Then let us bow down, Charmian, before the excessive majesty of the great god. Then there came a shouting and pervading around, pervading sound, as if from the mouth itself of him while the whole incumbent mass of, of ether in which we existed burst at once into a species of intense flame for, th for whose surpassing brilliancy and all fervid heat even the angels in the high heaven of pure knowledge have no name. Thus ended all. This was from the works of Edgar Allan Poe, which looks backwards to you, of course. This was from Volume 9, Essays and Philosophy. And this was published, this is a first edition copy published in 1904. So, thanks for listening.